it's about building rapport. And again, that goes to my driving force in life. That's what I love. Business of Architecture, episode 406. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with award-winning interior designer, luxury home furnishings designer and lifestyle expert, Robin Barron. Robin launched her full service design firm in 1990 after starting out in fashion design. Her unique sensibilities attracted a clientele that quickly grew to include celebrities and heads of major corporations. In 2017, Robin expanded her business with her signature home furnishings collection, including hardware, case goods, rugs, upholstery, and lighting, becoming a sought after designer of licensed home furnishing collections. Today, Robin Barron Design includes her full service design firm, her signature collections, and a multi-channel e-commerce site that provides a unique opportunity for designers and consumers to stop curated products with direct access to Robin's expert advice and design sensibility. In this episode, Robin takes us through her journey from being a fashion designer to an interior designer and to a product designer and what performance means for a business and her underlying principles in being an effective marketer and communicator. Robin also walks us through a little bit about the process from taking her product designs to getting them manufactured, how social media has been instrumental in connecting and nurturing a community for designers and very important advice for young Robin and designers looking to start their own design business. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Robin Barron. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Dot com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Robin, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you so much for having me on, Ryan. I so appreciate it. My absolute pleasure. Now, you are a eclectic designer, interior <laughs> designer. You've got product lines, an entrepreneur. Um, you're based out in, in, on the East Coast there in New York. Um, you've got a well-established business. And yes. I think my first question is, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit different here. What does, <laughs> what does performance mean and theatre mean to you inside of your design business? You know, that is such a great question that nobody has ever asked me before. <laughs> so I'm so excited to answer this. Fantastic. <laughs> you know, in a parallel universe, the path I would have taken was being an actress and singer. Mm. So that was really like my crossroads when I was a teenager. Which one do I go? I love both. Which path do I take? So in a parallel universe, I did take that path. And um, the way it comes out is that I love performing. Mm -hmm. I love being in the public. I love doing webcasts, podcasts, TV shows. I love speaking. I love presenting. So I get to have sort of the best of both worlds, my creativity with interior design. Mm -hmm. And I get to perform a lot because I do a lot of all of those things, speaking and whatnot. I'm in front of the public quite a bit. So um, I love that. And I really believe that when you go out in the public, even if it's for a panel discussion, your first directive is to keep the audience engaged, which means that you have to entertain them. And that means you have to be an entertainer. <laughs> it's part of it. Otherwise, they fall asleep, right? Yeah. So I, I get to use some of this in my, in my, you know, in my business and design work um, almost every day. Yeah. So, and I just realized that, you know, over the years, it wasn't a conscious thing. Yeah. It really happened over the years. <laughs> now, now this is, this is a wonderful kind of aspect of, of talking about, you know, in, in business is the, is being a performer, is being an entertainer. And for many designers, this might be like a really alien concept and also like wildly out of your comfort zone. Many people, you know, designers typically kind of, they can be, you know, more introverted, many of them. Yes. And yes. want to kind of, you know, be in their, in their work. And, and then often we, at design school, we have the dictum, the awful dictum, let your work speak for itself. Right. But your work doesn't, right. your work doesn't speak. 
it doesn't speak and you have to get it out there for it to speak to, for it to do any speaking at all. Yeah. If you don't get your work out there, if you don't get out there, how does your work get seen? Mm. So uh, I think what's what's you know very telling for me is that after a lot of speeches that I do and talks that I do, people come over and say, you know, they want they want to do different things, but they're introverted. They're not like me being extroverted. How do they do that? And I always say that you you bring who you are to everything you do. And there's no one way to achieve success. Mm. So you have to be true to yourself. And we always talk about being authentically yourself. That is so important mm -hmm. because you don't have to do it being an extrovert. You can do it your own way, being more of an introvert. But you have to find that pathway that pushes your envelope a little bit out of your comfort zone, but not so far out that you're not authentic. And there is a way. You just have to find it and experiment and, and see what feels right for you. Mm. Love it. How does how does this performance or theatre element of your business come through in, say, one-to-one -one relationships with clients? Oh, that's a that's another good question, Ryan. Um, I think because I have a big personality. And I'm fun and very personal, personable. And I think that I, I try to always connect with my clients, with anybody where they are, not where I want them to be, but where they are so they can hear me and see me. And so I think that that's a big part of it. I think um, if you if you know, if you bring who you are and you meet them where they can see and hear you, you can you can do almost anything. So I don't try to hide my my facial expressions, my dramatic personality from anybody. You know, you either jive with it or you don't. But but I, but I'm very good at being political and 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 meeting, as I said, meeting people where they are so that they can relate to it. When you first set up your business, how important was this element of theatre? And, and I know oh. you, you you said it was kind of it's kind of not a conscious thing that you've decided, but how important was it for you in those early days? And how is it kind of, and how does it, how does it embed itself with, with your other team members? So when I started my career out in fashion, right. so I was a fashion designer first. So I already come into the room with a little bit of drama between my big jewelry and my clothing and the way that I dress. So you sort of, ex you're, you're already braced for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not really the wallflower type. So you already know that. And so people tend to be attracted to that. And, um, and it was very, very important in my early part of the career because when you don't have the, the experience and, you know, the, the weight behind you of having done this for so many years, you have to sort of sell yourself more, right? Mm -hmm. And in selling yourself, that's showmanship, right? Yeah. I mean, a good salesperson is someone who, who's a showman in a way. So I think that, that um, it's always played a part in my life. It plays a part in my personal relationships too, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I think, I think that, um, again, it goes back to just being authentically who you are. I just wouldn't know how to be anybody else. And I wouldn't want to live a life that was contained. What's, what's the term? Don't, don't make yourself smaller than you are for anyone, yes. you know? So I think that that's, you know, that's key. But I think especially early in, in your careers, I think that fake it till you make it really is true. Yeah. I have a lot of stories about faking it till you make it. You would never know how nervous I was <laughs> asking for that first big deposit or taking on that first celebrity client, you know? Could you, could you give us an example of that? Because that's also, you know, again, we, we forget at one stage in our careers how nervous we were at doing something and then it just becomes second nature. That's and, right. and there's always a time for the first, you know, when you first seal one of your biggest clients yes. ever and you know it might be the case that you're still living in a little bed sit somewhere and you're now working with <laughs> you know somebody who's you know earning millions of dollars or whatever and then and then you know but it, it kind of evolves yes yes so my one of the first time or the first time I had the, the my biggest client to that point um he was the CEO of an international company very well known and I'm doing it's a very very big project here in New York City putting two big apartments together. There was no budget. It was everything from construction through the decorating process. And 
I had, and they were older than I was, you know, because I was young, you know, I was younger. And don't forget, it's not just an experience, it's also age, right? Yes. You're meeting, you know, big wigs and then they're, they're older and more experienced. So I just sort of armored up. I wore like an Armani suit. I wore, you know, good jewelry. I, 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 I armored up with what I was wearing. <laughs> and um, I just took a deep breath. And I really believe this, that you just take a deep breath and you dive in. Mm. And I dove in. I just sort of trusted myself. I do meditate since I'm 17. So I meditated before I went. <laughs> and I, I centered myself and I went in there and um, faked it till I made it. I mean, I just ta you know talked with authority yeah. and gave opinions. I had to make sure that you have to make sure that you have authority and you're talking. You can't just be meek and mild and insecure. Yes. You have to come across as confident and experienced. So that's part of the acting of it, right? If you if you don't have that, you've got to you've got to put that on. But it's and, um, but it's not it's not pretending though, is it? It's not no. it's not and it's not lying and it's not deceitful. No, no. And, it is truly finding that center within yourself, yeah. which is why I meditate because that helps me center myself. It's just having confidence in who you are and knowing that you could do it. The acting is in making somebody else believe that you could do it. You know, also. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but it's not. But but I had complete confidence that I knew I could do this, and so the the retainer for that project it was a big project and all. It was a very big retainer, and I just did exactly what I said. I took a deep breath, and asked for it because Ryan, if you don't ask for it, you don't get it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I once had a, um, a a business mentor say to me, "If you've got money problems, it's because you haven't asked for money." <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's that's great. I love you, that. <laughs> you're not asking. You haven't asked enough people. You haven't asked anybody that's, for it. <laughs> that's Bri exactly right. Brilliant, brilliant. And so, and so, tell us a little bit about um, about where the where the practice is now. And where, where, you know, obviously you're, you're based in New York. How, how, how large is the practice? What kind of work are you specializing in at the moment? So I've always focused mostly on residential. Yeah. I've done a couple of restaurants and spas, doctor's offices, things like that. But, but really some hospitality. But mostly I do residential, which I love because, you know, my tagline for my business is confidence begins at home. I really believe that what I do can affect people in positive ways, help them be happier, more empowered in their lives. And so uh, the, the home is my vehicle, but my drive, my driving force is to, to really empower people. So I love doing residential. Um, I've been in business <clears throat> for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's 32 years. And um and I, I have a really good staff that helps me. You do not do this alone. It takes a village. It truly takes a village. Yeah. I'm smaller now than pre-COVID because, you know, COVID really affected us. But sure. I will say that um, we're very busy and the staff is being built back up and we're busier than ever at the moment. Um, I have done many um, high profile clients from celebrities that you would know where I have to sign NDAs. So I can't really mention yeah, them, but I've sure. done quite a few celebrities, um, heads of major companies, international companies. Um, I love doing high-end work. I love the no budget jobs because I get to be really creative and, and the clients go along with, with the, um, you know, they go along with it. They, they really take that, that leap of faith mm -hmm. so that you can really be creative and they get the best of me that way. They get the most, you know, exciting projects. But I will tell you this, I have a lot of normal, you know, people also <laughs> that are clients. And so um, I have a lot of normal people as well, <laughs> quote unquote normal. And what's great about that is that I really get to be in people's homes, in their families, in their day to day lives, you know, and that is so important for me because for me, a lot of what I do is about the relationships that I build. Yeah. So I, I really love having that interaction with real people and real families. Um, and those jobs, not every job is, is no budget, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Some jobs have tighter budgets than others. And I, I pride myself in being able to work within certain parameters for in, in many different um, budgets, many different looks, because it's not about what I want and what my design aesthetic is. That's perfect for my own home. Yeah. But when I'm designing for someone else, it's about their home and how they live. Mm. So um, I, I love the gamut of who, who my, my client spectrum is. 
Are you how have you changed your methods over the last few years in the ways that you win work? Do you find nowadays that work comes much more readily to you or people you've because you've got such a large like marketing ecosystem that's been well established that work comes easier or have the methods changed versus when you first started when well, I imagine you were probably knocking on doors more and yes that kind of yes stuff. well for sure you know it's funny um this is a multi-pronged answer right when I first started there was of course no 32 years ago there was no social media nothing you know, there wasn't even the internet. <laughs> there was like nothing. So um, at that point, I did a lot of print things. And I would, I would, I, I started my business. Um, I was president of the board of my co-op here in New York City. And people started to see what I had done in the renovation and decorating of my apartment. Then somebody else asked me to do theirs. And my business within a year period really snowballed into having a proper business. So from there, word of mouth. I've always mostly built my business through word of mouth. Um, I did do print things. I would go to real estate brokers and send them, you know, brochures that I made up or gifts or packages. I always try to work with real estate brokers. I find that they are truly um, a, a really good resource for designers. And then as, as time went on, word of mouth started to grow. And I started to do more and more things like TV. I started to get, I got, I did a newsletter, a printed newsletter for a few years, just before really everything blew up with like started with social media, not even blew up, but started with social media, at which point I changed it to a blog. Right. So, and, and then I was very early on in social media and I'm very active in social now. Um, so it's definitely changed to be electronic. Everything we do now is electronic, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but I will tell you that what, that what has not changed, what is exactly the same, is that you have to put yourself out there. Right. You have to be seen and heard to get business. So whether that is referrals, whether that is from real estate brokers, whether that is from social media, TV, or, or speaking, you have to put yourself out there. So it's just a matter of, tailoring it to what's happening in the world at the time, but the marketing still remains marketing and you still have to market yourself. Yes. And even now people come to me, I don't search out work. People come to me, but I'm constantly marketing because I'm always on social yeah. and social is a big part of, of my whole business. Yeah. What, what would you say are some of the kind of underlying principles for being an effective marketer and an effective communicator at scale, if you like? Okay, great question. The first thing is you have to know your goals. Nothing makes sense unless you know your goals. Don't invest a dollar. Don't put out one tweet. Don't put out one post until you know your goals. Because you, if you don't know where you want to go, you don't know how to get there. It's not just putting out posts on, on, you know, on IG. You don't want to just post. You want to post with a purpose. Mm -hmm. So know your goals and then you can decide which platforms are best for you and, and how you want to come across. So in my business, I have my design firm, I have my products, and I have me as the personality. And that is, those are my three, three, three prongs of the business where I have to promote. So I've got to know what the goal is for each of those and then come up with a marketing plan for, for each of them and, and then figure out how to rotate them on social because I don't have three different accounts. You want one account. You don't want to start siphoning off your, your followers. So, and if you check me out, my Instagram is at Robin Barron official, but I just want to say I had 35,000 followers and I got hacked. I, oh. I did get hacked and everything. I have all those years of posts and followers completely wiped out. So just a, a couple of months ago, I had to start from scratch. So oh, follow this, me on at Robin Barrett official. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, this is becoming more and more frequent with people's accounts getting, they're, they're becoming more and more vulnerable on Instagram. It's yeah. heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. I, I, Sorry I, to hear that. yeah, that was a not great, but you know what? It's only Instagram. It's not my life. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have to take well, everything in stride. Well, well, what's interesting, you know, you, you're, you were illustrating there that pre-social media, you had strategies in hard copy prints. You had strategies yes. in different platforms. And it's not, you know, it's not becoming necessarily becoming a master of the platform as such, but master of those principles. And then when a new platform emerges, you can redeploy all of that intelligence that you've accumulated 
And right now, you know, you, some of the stuff that you've learned in the newsletters, you can apply to your Instagram account. And that perfectly said, Ryan, perfectly said, because marketing is still marketing and that's the same. It's just what platforms you apply it to. What what kind of stuff has really worked for you in terms of that communication, that kind of, um, you know, in terms of newsletters and captivating people's attention and, and having viral posts or kind of building an audience? What are some of the content hacks maybe or strategies or, or things that you found really resonate with your audience? You know, I've had to find a, a real balance because as I said, like with the three different prongs, they're, they're sort of three different groups of people, you know, of followers. So some love to have beautiful photos, inspirational photos and, mm. and, 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 you know, design work. Some love the personality part of it. And some people, you know, like product and want to shop. So I've had to find that balance. But I think the, 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 the thing that runs through all of it is to um, really I keep saying this, we all keep saying this, be authentic. So, so whatever I do, there's an exuberance to, you know, even if it's, if it's in the actual, not, not just the visual post, but even what we write, I always use exclamation points. I'm always talking about helping people, you know, or, or inspiring people. And I think that, that um, for me, that's really worked because people feel like they're my friend, you know, they feel like I could be their best friend. And, and that's, that's an incredible compliment to me. You know, I'm not, I'm not hands off. Uh, I'm, I'm approachable. And for me, as a running thread, no matter what I'm promoting, that's really important to me. Mm. And I think that's what resonates. And that's really the consistent thing, whether it was a newsletter, it's the blog, it's the social media, it's the, it's the personal appearances. It's the, the running thread is that I'm approachable and, um, I, I guess it's, I don't want to say I'm inspiring, but, but my goal is to inspire. So yes. I think people, people get that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, how do you then um, target the audience and make sure that it's the right people that you're communicating with? And, and, and how do you kind of, you know, cause I've seen many people, they'll start with a newsletter and maybe they'll kind of just do a shotgun approach and then that doesn't work. And then it's like, okay, that was, I'll give up on this or try something else. How do you, how have you refined your audience or how do you cultivate them or make sure that you're, you're talking to the right people? Well, I think, I think you have to figure out who, who your basic audience is. For mm. me, it's, you know, fashionistas, you know, people are interested in fashion, interested right. in lifestyle, interested in design of all kinds, interested in art, uh, you know, um, they may or may not be creatives themselves, but but they want to be. They appreciate it. That that for me is, um, I'm uh, you know that that that's sort of that that's sort of like who who I gear it to. Yeah, because I think that that that's what it's shown over the years is who gravitates to me. Got it. Got it. Brilliant. And when you're working, for example, with some of these higher tier clients, let's call them. Um, how did they start getting on your books? How did they initially find you? Or how did you start landing those sorts of caliber of clients? These are the clients that everybody wants to That's right. get, get on their books. <laughs> and it's, it's no easy feat. And it's no easy feat to retain them. That's right. That's retaining clientele is a whole different thing completely. Um, the way that I've gotten them is by going out there and taking those, th those risks. So approaching real estate brokers, some of the biggest clients I've had, I've had through real estate brokers. Some have been through accountants or money managers. You know, who is it that has the clients that you want to have? And those are the people you have to court. Yeah. Right. Because you can't get to the celebrity, you can't get to the CEO, you can't get to heads of corporations. But you can get to the people that work with them. So whether it's going, I remember I used to go to a lot of charity events, you know, and, 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 and other events, I, I would find a way to get invited or say yes to every time I was invited because I would mix and mingle with people that that maybe weren't in my social circle. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, 
sometimes a, your own social circle is not the people that recommend you. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's the people that meet you through business. So um, I would do a lot of that. I do less of that now, but I will go, but, but less than I did when I was, was building the business. Um, but that's how you do it. You, you go, you decide who it is you want as your clients, and then you go to the, the, the concentric circles that surround these people mm -hmm. and you start to meet them. So, so how, do you, how do you successfully court and woo a, a realtor, a real estate broker? What, oh. what's, what's, what's the dating? Pro what does date one look like and versus date 10? So date one today would be an email. Right. Okay. It would be an email. Um, and I would send out an email, introduce myself, um, send my, my link. You know, in New York, in New York, a lot of real estate brokers, a lot of people know me because I've been so public. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit easier to do that now. But even when I was coming up, I would send an email first and introduce myself. And then the next, and I would say, in the email, I would say, I'm going to call you in the next couple of days, or I'll call you on Tuesday or whatever. And I would call. I would follow up with a phone call, try to get them on the phone. You don't always get somebody on the phone, but I would do what I said I would do and then send an email and say, I just tried you. I left a voicemail. Um, I'd love to get together. And I would invite them to lunch, which they may or may not come to. Right. And then I would send them a book of some of my work. I would, today, it's easy. You can go on, on, um, on any one of those sites like um, not Lucky Fish, but Snapfish or, you know, all those sites. Now I'm just blocking it for the moment, but yeah. all those sites and, and produce books very inexpensively. And I would send them a book and I'd wrap it in my color, branding colors, and, um, and they would get it. And maybe it would be a box of chocolate as well. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes you get a call and sometimes you don't. But I've gotten calls a year later, a year and a half later, and say, I saved your card, I saved your book or whatever, and I get calls. Um, I can tell you one, one funny story is that, so same idea. This is only a few years ago. I went to a real deal. Real deal is a real estate, you know, it's a, it's a real estate publication I, here. Yep, I know. And they had an event here in the city. So I went to the event thinking that I would meet developers because, you know, that's that, uh, that's right up my alley to do uh, development, do buildings. So I went to see if I would meet some developers there. So I was walking around introducing myself to developers, handing them not just a card. A business card means nothing. I would hand them a card that had photos on it, mm -hmm. photo of me, photo of my work. And I would hand that to them so they, they would have a, a remembrance of who it was they were speaking to. And I went to this real estate broker who was getting to be very well known or was very well known because he's on TV all the time. And I, he wasn't there. So I gave my card. And the next day I called him in his office and said, I met your staff. I was at the real deal. He took a meeting with me and I met with him in his office and I ended up, he, he recommended me for work, but I did his home with his wife. So that was Ryan Sirhan from Million Dollar oh, wow. Listing. <laughs> and that was just because I went to the real deal. I knew he was because I watched the show. Yeah. He had a Ryan Sirhan booth. I went over there and just introduced myself. So you, you just have to put yourself out there and don't limit yourself with your limited thinking of what you've done or what you should do, could do, other people do. Yeah. Just where do you want to go? What's your goal? And you, you'll find your own way to get there. Take the risk. What, you don't what, take a chance. You don't get one, baby. What's, what's, what's the sort of the burning purpose that you have behind being able to do this? What's the, the thing that kind of excites you and gets you up in the morning? And, and because, again, for, for a lot of people, like what you just described there, of like just going to a networking event and introducing yourself and getting into conversations, that would terrify people. Yeah. But, but like if there's but if there's a burning purpose there, then often, you know, that kind of fear falls away. What is what is that purpose for you? Well, my the biggest driver for me, the, 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 the one that's really the deepest, that really excites me the most is confidence begins at home. Right. It's really affecting people in their lives and, and helping them, you know, be their best selves and have their best life and be happy in life. That's my biggest driver. And and. And so that's why I get up in the morning and do what I do. The, the other driver is that I love being creative and I love creating homes. I love homes because you are affecting people in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. And it's also, 
a lot of elements that come together. It's about the client. It's about color. It's about space. It's, there are so many elements that come into creating a home for and with someone that, that my creative juices get going when I get a great project. But my ultimate driver deep down is that <clears throat> I love people. I love relationships and I love impacting people in a positive way. That's really, truly the one I get the most animated talking. It's about that. You know, I love the creativity. I love designing. I love all the pretty things. I love the colors, textures, but it's the relationships and the impact I can have on people that, that really make me happy. I love it. Amazing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your product line? And how that how that emerged? Has this been something? Is this a new addition to your your services, or is this something that's been going for quite a long time? And what were some of the? How did you how did you get it started? So I never see anything just the way it is. I'm always you know seeing things the way they could be. Mm -hmm. So I've been customizing and custom making and designing furniture, lighting, rugs everything for the home since the first job I ever had. It's just my nature, you know, as, as a fashion designer, as an interior designer. So along the way, as I'm building the business and I'm designing so many of these products myself, I wanted to start having products. I wanted to do licensing. I wanted to start having a bigger impact than only the jobs that I was working on. Um, but, you know, when I started that whole process, it wasn't as popular as it is now. Now everybody is licensing, everybody's doing product. So it was a little bit of an uphill, I don't want to say battle, but mm -hmm. uphill chattel, challenge. Yes. So what I decided to do is I started to produce my own product before I went out heavily for licensing because I felt I'd have more control over it. And I know that I would say yes to me. <laughs> so I said yes to me and I started producing and I now have um, my own signature um, lighting, rugs, upholstery, case goods. And the thing I'm, I'm most known for is my hardware because I love jewelry, <laughs> as you can see. And to me, the hardware is truly the jewelry of a home. So the hardware that you'd put on a cabinet, you know, on furniture. So I do big, bold jewelry, just like hardware. <laughs> yeah. Big, bold. I wear big, bold jewelry and I do big, bold hardware. So I started with all of that. And, um, and then now I have included licensing. So I just came out with a, with a license, eight, seven licensed, collection, licensed collections for a big lighting company, the Minka Group. And I came out with a, hard, a licensed hardware collection with Hamilton Sinclair, which is a beautiful upscale hardware manufacturer. Um, and I have more in the works that we'll be announcing soon. So now I'm doing licensing. So, and, and what's great is that I have so much experience in my own product now, manufacturing, designing, going through the whole gamut of, 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 of um the process. And I should have mentioned, I'm sorry, I also do rugs. I have a really great, beautiful, big rug collection. So um, I bring the experience I have of producing, designing and manufacturing and producing and shipping my own goods to the table when I do licensing, which I think is, is really important because I'm giving, I'm bringing more than just, you know, designs on a piece of paper to a manufacturer. Sure. <clears throat> so it, it's, I remember once uh, listening to a Tom Dixon talk and um him saying if he knew how much trouble was involved in taking an idea through manufacturing then you know no sane person would ever would ever do it um could that's you, the truth <laughs> could, could, you, could you walk us through a little bit about what is what's that process like from taking something to getting a prototype to getting it manufactured and, and where are the challenges where are where, the where aren't the challenges, <laughs> to be honest with you, because it's every step. So licensing is very different. So I'm going to address doing my own product. The designing of the product is the easiest part of it because, you know, that's, that's my nature. I'm, I'm designing product all the time. Then, but then you have to be able to, first of all, you have to find the right manufacturing partners because um, every workroom, every manufacturer are not the same. They don't have the same proceeds. They don't. They don't have the same um, K 
capabilities. They don't have the same um, abilities with different materials. So you've got to find the right one who can also speak your language that you that you can understand each other. So that's the first challenge is finding the right rug manufacturer, the right lighting manufacturer, the right, you know, the, the, the right case goods workroom, whatever it may be. And then you you have to you have to work on the pricing because prototypes, you know, it's it very expensive. You pay for prototypes. They're not free. So you do the prototyping and um, and now you have the product. So what do you do with it, Ryan? You have to show it. Right. So now you have to figure out what venues are you going to show it through. Are you going to show it through something like do a high point showroom, which I've done? I did Dallas and High Point. I did the New York ICFF show, the New York Now show, um, where I was the spokesperson for the New York Now show as well, just so you know. <laughs> Love it. But um, then you have to have the marketing arm because showing it is great, but it means nothing also unless you market it. It's like dominoes. It's one thing next to the other. One builds on the other. And you have to take the whole, the whole the holistic approach when you look at this. So the challenge along the way are all these different steps, but you have to be able to build on one to the other. Mm -hmm. And you have to be prepared financially for that because it's not enough to have the money to produce the, the, the prototype. It's not enough to have the money to now go out and, and take a showroom or decide where you're going to show. It's not enough to market it. You have to do all of that. And then, and then you're lucky enough to sell. Now you produce it, you have to produce it on time, you have to ship it, it has to get to the client hole. There are lots of things that happen during shipping. Yep. And you have to then, you know, make the client happy. So like, you know, if I'm selling to the trade, because I've, I've, until recently with my new e-commerce site, I've sold all my products to the trade. I build those relationships. You know, I may invite them to a panel to speak or my on my IG, Ask Robin Live on Thursday nights, mm -hmm. or or I send them a gift or I send them a card or a thank you. You've got to build those relationships, you know, with even in retail, but especially when you're doing to the trade. Yeah. So so um, it's really important that you look again at your goals and then you look at, at the steps how to get there and you financially plan for it. You know, I did not do that. I did not have a business plan and say, this is what I'm going to be doing. I wish I was more like that as a person, but I'm not, even as a businesswoman, I really trust my gut. Mm -hmm. So I go for it. I do take, I'm a big risk taker. I go for it. And, and that's great because knock wood, it's worked out for me, yeah. <laughs> but, but you have to know who you are. That's the other step of this. The other challenge, Ryan, you have to know who you are, how much risk you're willing to take on. And what the best steps are for you to get someplace so that you can be whole yourself during that process, because it will pull you apart, especially if you already have another business. My design firm has, is always very busy. Now I'm doing products and I'm showing it shows and it pulls you in different directions. Now I have my e-commerce site and my licensing. Ryan, I am not for the faint hearted. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. It's a lot. It's Amazing. a lot. We'll, we'll, we'll come to the e-commerce in, in just a second. Um, but go, going back to the some of the, the products that you've you've created, and you were talking about the different phases of financing that you need to have available from prototype into marketing to then taking it actually into in um, into production. Did you ever seek outside finance, or did you have to work with investors to kind of invest in some of these projects, or? Was it totally from profits that from your design services? How did you, how did you figure it out? Well, up until now, I've done it myself yep. with profit from the design business. I should, sort of bootstrapped everything. You know, I just, I just went and did it and took the leap <laughs> within myself and and did it and find self finance. Um, but with the e-commerce site, what I realized is that at this point, I've done everything that I can to make it successful, sort of bootstrapping it. Right. But to really take an e-commerce site into the real public and really make it successful, especially with everybody, you know, in that space now, mm -hmm. especially since COVID, you really need to have deeper pockets because it's 100% a marketing play. 
Yeah. And you need marketing dollars to be able to get your name out there and be heard and seen amongst all the other noise that is out there and competition that is out there. So at this point, um, I'm sort of at a crossroads. What do, what, what are my goals? What do I want to accomplish with the e-commerce site? If I really want to make it big, then I need to have outside financing because the marketing is just so expensive. Yeah. And because you need to do so much of it. Um, so, you know, or do I, I could keep it as a boutique, you know, uh, e-commerce site like I have now. And part of that decision is going out for, for outside money. And part of it is how much time and energy do I want to put into it to make it big when I have the other things going on? Yeah. You know, you truly, anyone that said to a woman, you could have it all. They absolutely lied. Okay. <laughs> it's a compromise on every level. Something has to give. So, you know, what is it going to be? What do you want to give? It's, it's everything in life is a compromise. So I have to make that decision now because, um, I'm at that crossroads with it. Amazing. As that's a very interesting crossroads to be at. Um, in, in terms of some some of the, the products, for example, you know, this is so different from regular design services where you're working one on one with person with person. Here, as you're saying, you know, the big spend comes with the marketing because you want to scale this thing. I'm, I'm presuming right. you want to scale it, you want to have it into different people's and it's not this is really a case where your work you need to have those platforms and vehicles so that more people see it and develop a relationship. What, what are some of the insights that you've got about this kind of mass marketing that kind of now can play a, a powerful role in say the one-on-one -on -one services that you provide? Well, you know, I try to keep them somewhat separate right? in that I don't ever want a client that's hiring me for my design in my design firm to think I'm only pushing my products. Right. Right. So, and they may come to me because they've seen my products and they, or they've heard my name or whatever, but I, I'm very careful to separate what I do individually for people in my design firm and what I do publicly and the products that I have out there. Got it. So, um, but the one thing that does carry over is knowing human nature. You know, if, you know, I love people, I love relationships, as I said. So I try to bring that to, to both aspects of it. And that includes being out in the mass market because, you know, a, a, a lot of what can break through all that noise and competition is if they get to know me, mm. you know, like it's, it's, you know, I'm not going to compare myself at this moment to the names we all know in similar or adjacent spaces, but we know those names. That's because their personality carried through. And for me, that would be that, that has always worked for me on to the levels that I, that I have achieved yeah. and to go further, I would, I would want to play that up. And that's really my strength with my clients. You said, how do you keep clients? How do you have return clients? It's all about relationships, because one of the other things I always say is that if you can sell yourself, you could sell anything because selling yourself means building trust. It means, you know, building a rapport. And that is what I try to do, even with my, you know, e-commerce site, you know, or if I'm wholesaling product or, you know, licensing product and have to be there with all the retailers as they look at this, like this big lighting collection I did for Minka Group. Um, it's about building rapport. And, and that, and again, that goes to my driving force in life. That's what I love. So amazing. I mean, and it goes back to like what you were saying about the, the, the importance of having that kind of a three pronged approach where one of those prongs is, is you, you as a personality, because it's, that becomes a real unique selling point. People develop that relationship with you. And then the way that when someone sees your product, it reminds them of you and how you made them feel. And right. it's kind of, again, it's, it's scaling that connection at mat on, you know, on, on, you know, on mass. Absolutely. And, and I think that that's true for anybody in any, in any business, especially, you know, if it has your name on it or you're the face of the business, I think that, you know, you are your business, you mm -hmm. are your marketing, you know, you, you, you always need to bear that in mind, you know, and I do bear that in mind, you know, when I go out in the public, I know, I mean, I dress the same way all the time in, in that I'm always wearing big jewelry and I'm always wearing black. I wear black all the time, just a little side note, because my hair is a color. I wear funky glasses. I wear big jewelry. I dress fashion, fa you know, high fashion. And I have a big personality. So really, 
it's enough. It's enough. You don't need color too. <laughs> <laughs> I am the color. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I always, you know, have a look, but I make sure that, that when I go out in the public that I, that I played up that look to some degree so that it's recognizable. And so that it's, it's part of really who I am. You know what I mean? Yes. Because I, I am the face of it all. <laughs> I love it. I love it. There's a, there's the, there's, there's the, it's, again, it's that kind of coming back to the theater and the performance of it as well. That's the, right. The, the, That's the, right. I'm the brand. So, so, you know, you have to know what you're getting, right? <laughs> Amazing. How, how has the industry changed since when you first started? What have, what have been some of the Ooh. major shifts and changes that you've seen and, and perhaps some of the, you know, more of the optimistic and more of the concerns? Well, the biggest change, I think, is that when I started, designers in New York were very snobby and uppity, and it was, it was very closed, closed. You know, nobody would share information. Nobody would share knowledge. Nobody would, would include anybody. What's really changed everything is social media. Now, we all can rag on social media all we want and all the negative aspects, but it's because of social media that we now have true community. Mm. I mean, that is nationally here in the States, but also in New York with the best of the best and snobbiest of, you know, <laughs> um, designers that has really changed we help each other we support each other there are facebook groups that all we do is talk about how to help each other asking each other questions i belong to a group called design share here in new york it's 15 of the top design firms in the city and we meet every month and we we talk about we have different things that that we we either talk about or we have guest speakers or we go to a special location to learn something and during the month, we're constantly emailing, do you know a great person for this? I need, you know, whatever it may be. There is true community, whether it's through ASID, IFDA, really and truly, it's become very strong and it's because of social media that did not exist before social media. So that's been a really big, it's a huge change because so many designers in this country work alone as a sole practitioner yeah. or have one person in their firm and they feel so isolated. And now we are a community in the very best sense of the word. So that's a big positive change to me. Um, another big positive change is on the wholesale level, High Point and manufacturers. Even in 2008, I went to High Point to speak to manufacturers about opening up their doors to designers. They only wanted retailers. They looked down upon designers. They didn't understand that we had a heavy pen, that we wrote a lot of business. Now, all that's changed. Now every manufacturer is open to designers. When you go down to market at High Point or any of the markets in the country, there are parties. We're being feted. It's it's a we're, they're opening the doors, to having licensed relationships. It is very very different than it used to be. That old boys network that was a closed closed door to designers and women. So all of that is the positive. Um, the negative. I always like to look at the positive. I'm not always that great at looking at the negative, to be honest. But um, or, or, or concerns or <laughs> elements of of you know that could potentially be challenges. The the only real concerns or challenges is that um, I've always wanted to open up the world of interior design to mm -hmm. everybody, so everybody could have beautiful homes and have access to it. But now what's happening is that you have a lot of retailers that are that are that are doing design for free. They're, 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 they're sort of trying to devalue what a lot of designers do. It doesn't really affect me much on, on the level that I work, yeah. but it, it creeps in. And for other decorators and designers that, 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 that are doing um, other types of work, it affects them greatly. Yes. So, so um, I think that that's something that our industry as a whole is kind of reeling from, you know, trying to deal with, trying to figure out, another way to 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 flourish with with all of that absolutely what what makes a successful delivery team so both in terms of your own internal team your designers that you work with in within your office but also with your consultants so working with architects engineers other people contractors um i think first of all you have to have a rapport you have to be in sync. 
You don't have to have the exact same tastes and the exact same outlook on life, but you do need to have a rapport. You need to, you need to be able to ha- be able to understand each other with more than just words. You have to be in sync with, um, you know, with, with ha- I guess how you see, how you see the world. I guess you do have to have the same kind of, of view of the world, I suppose, but not the same taste and the same point of views about everything. But you, but you need to have, like, understand how to work with a client. You need to understand the support that each of you needs. You know, the best thing that, that, that I can have in life is support from everyone that I work with. And I want to give people around me that support. And, and, and collaboration is important to me. So I want to work with people that collaborate. I've worked with architects and other, you know, engineers and whatnot that, that don't like the collaboration. That for me is never going to work. I want to ask you what you think, and I want you to, to weigh what I think. I, I, I like that collaboration. I think it makes us all better. And I, I work that way with my own staff as well. You could be an intern that works for me, and I still want collaboration. I don't just give you, you know, samples to return. I throw you into the wolves and you get your, your sleeves up and you're in the thick of it. And that's how you learn. And that's how I learn from you, because I do learn from everyone, whether it's an architect on the job, the client on the job or an intern on the job. And so um, I think that, that that's re- really important to just find people that you can you can have a rapport with. Brilliant. Also, because of quality of life, because if I can't laugh with you and have fun with you and have that rapport, then I don't want to work with you. I don't want <laughs> I want I want to have I work so hard 24 seven. I want to have some fun with it and be with people that I do really like. How, how do you how do you disqualify <laughs> clients then? How do you like what are the, some of the red flags when, you know, you you go, you know what, this is not going to be a fit. They're not going to be the right ones for, for me. How do you recognize that and then what do you do when you have recognized it yeah that one is really a tough one because sometimes you don't read the red flags early enough you know yes um and i can imagine that you're probably a, a very optimistic and <laughs> my problem <laughs> and have, always a love, look- have a love for people and <laughs> i'm always looking for the good and so i Definitely. Um, and that's happened to me in personal relationships, too. I'm always looking for the good and I just ignore the flags because I don't want to see the negative. Yes. So it's a life lesson for me. I have to still <laughs> learn. <laughs> but if someone seems like a negative person, mm-hmm. I can't do that. Um, if, you know, if someone if you think someone as you're talking like I don't I don't have a minimum. I don't discuss a minimum that I have when I work with a client, but I will drop certain, you know, tells and hints and whatever and see the reaction if you know if they feel that they're, that they're very um it's not being cost conscious because everybody's cost conscious everybody is you know wants to be concerned about how much they spend and whatever whether it's a lot or not it there's always a budget but if someone is very tight like you know that they have an unhealthy relationship with money yes that's going to impact what I, the work I do and the relationship I have and can build with them because by nature I'm spending their money yeah you know so I, I look for those kinds of red flags if someone is um you know it's it's so subtle Ryan it's not it's not just the big things it's the little things it's it's how they talk about other people you know what they say look at someone in a restaurant and how they treat the waiter take note of that because that's how they're going to end up treating you it's those little things that I that 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 I kind of look for Mm. um how and you 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 mentioned there as well that you know ultimately you're spending your clients money how do you do that how do you make sure that you're looking after your clients budget and how do they trust you with money are you working with you know Many, I know many interior designers, they might take a, a large chunk of cash from the client and it's in an escrow account or whatever, and then you've actually got free reign to, to spend it. How do you manage things financially? I don't do that. I, I, don't do that. I mean, I will for some, once in a while, you get a client that, that wants that because they don't want to be okay. bothered. I will do that. But, but typically, I don't like to work that way. I always like a client to be in control of their money. Sure. So um, what I do is early in the project, not the first thing, because first thing we have to do the plans, I have to know what we're doing, the scope of work. At that point, after that's all approved, then I do a budget. And I do a budget that is a range from low to high, realistic low to high. Um, And 
I then I then and I do it line item by line item. So when I review it with a client, they see that the bottom line number may be big, but when you start breaking it down by the sofa, the pillows, the let it, it's it it's realistic. So they sign off on that. But I go before they sign off on it, I go through that budget with them. So there's no surprises. The best way to handle money is no surprises. Why? People, when it comes to money, everybody is funny with money. Their eyes glaze over. They don't want to talk about it, right? And so I want it up front on the table. I want them to see it. I want them to sign off on it. And then that bottom line budget, not the line items. It doesn't matter if we spend more on a table or less on a sofa. It's the bottom line budget. Um, I We're always adhering to. We, we end up having a third column on the budget that's actual so that we can compare it anytime with a client. We could send it to them and it's their low to high and the actual and they can see where they stand in a budget. Now, sometimes we go over budget. Usually it's because the client approve things that were over the budget and they just love them, but they know they're going over budget. Yep. You know what I mean? I don't want them at the end of the job to go, oh my God, I had no idea. So I take it very seriously. I don't like to take money up front. Uh, I take a retainer up front for my work, sure. but in terms of money to start purchasing, I want them to approve every purchase or every billing package. And I want them to, to know that they're always in control of their money. Yes. Yeah. And if and if I do take money um, on account for product, which, as I said, once in a while, clients, some clients prefer that I always send them the same billing packages. They still have to sign off on it. And then I spend it. I don't just surprise them and say, I bought all this for <laughs> you. I would. I just know. <laughs> right. OK, so it's a, it's a very controlled process. Correct. Great. It has to be. It has to be. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier as well that obviously with some of your um, kind of higher tier ca um, clients, let's say, that you're often made to sign non-disclosure agreements. Yes. Uh, this can be quite problematic in many ways because you're now not allowed to photograph the work or you're not allowed to publish the work. Or That's right. How do you navigate that with, with clients? And do you have any other ways that you get compensated if you're not allowed to publish the 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 work or you just that's part of their terms and conditions you gotta that's right you gotta suck it that's up right and be you like, just right. can't do it can't use their names can't can't photograph it even if i don't say whose it is i can't use it but that's what you that's what happens when you work with celebrities yeah you know some once in a while you get a celebrity who likes all the publicity and stuff but but initially it starts out with an nda you know what i mean they have they you could maybe maybe build the relationship where they'll say yes at some point. But I had one celebrity who I will not name who, who said that they were going to be in a certain magazine and with their, with their home and they were definitely going to be using me. And, and, and I mean, I did the whole place and everything was custom construction through decorating and they were going to, you know, you tell everybody it was me and put me in the article and all that. Well, not only did he not do that, but he, he said somebody else did the work. Oh. <laughs> yep. Oh, the heartbreak. Yep. So, you know, but you can't, you know, I, it still hurts. It still stings. Yeah. But I will say that you just move on. Yeah. Life's too short. Life's too full. There's too many good things and too many good people. And you just keep trucking along. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. Amazing. What's what's in store for you for the rest of this wonderful year, 2022? Well, I have um, some licensing agreements that we're just signing. So we will have some other license collections coming out. Um, very, very busy in, in the design business, the design firm. So like <laughs> so busy. I, I, I really don't have time to sleep, to be honest. And um and I have some new hardware of my own collection coming out. I don't have a lot coming out in my the rest of my collections because, you know, COVID was, you know, not the time for me to start expanding in my own product. But I, I did expand into some new hardware pieces. And um, and I have the e-commerce site. So the e-commerce site is we're going to pump it up this year or I'm going to just, you know, really um, – go into what's the word lean into the boutiqueness of it one or the other amazing <laughs> brilliant robin 
I think that's a perfect place for us to conclude the conversation. Actually, actually, one more, one more final question. Sure. What would you, if you were to meet yourself um, 32 years ago, what advice would you give to yourself upon starting up the business? You know, I know a lot of people, you know, answer these kind of questions, like going back and saying that you're okay and you are loved and you are worth it and you are all that. <laughs> That's all absolutely true. But I think ultimately, um, I spent a lot of a lot more time. People may not realize this if they know me, but I spent more time being more insecure than than as secure as I am now. Mm. And I just can't even believe I, I I did that. I think just just trust yourself and go for the joy. Beautiful, Robin. Wise words. Thank you so <laughs> much. Your energy and enthusiasm and passion is contagious. I thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you. Oh, thank you so much, Ryan. I really, really appreciated you. I think you're terrific too. So thank you so much for having me on. My pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.